Happy Thursday and welcome back everyone to the Metropole Dispatch, reporting from our kitchens and living rooms across Vienna. My name is Ryan, your host for the evening. The Metropole Dispatch is your daily anchor if you feel lost in the spiral of events or just want to connect. This is your daily source of support and advice in English. Metropole is Austria's main source of news and updates in English and the team greatly relies on your support in these hard times. To show your solidarity, please subscribe to Metropole. More than ever, every subscription counts. You can also donate, buy books like our Survival Guide for Health, or individual copies of our magazine. And a big thank you to our subscribers who make Metropole possible. Uh, if you have questions tonight, please drop them in the comment section, and I can ask them to the guests on the show today. Last week, we had Peter Berry, copyright manager at the digital rights organization Epicenter.Works, to discuss the Stop Corona app and what happens to our digital rights in a time like coronavirus. Um, if we do confront any technical difficulties, uh, live streaming is an imperfect uh, solution to, to in-person in, in meetings, so uh, bear it with us. Um, Tonight, the Dispatch is hosting Metropole's April Salon, an event that would normally take place in person. We are privileged to have a number of Metropole contributors for, from the spring edition Minds of Vienna to join us this evening. We have Simon Ballum uh, to discuss diplomacy and the intimate life of Clemens von Metternich, Dardis McNamee, Metropole's editor-in-chief, to talk about the interview with prominent linguist and, journal and, and, and feminist professor Ruth Vodak, Philip Rossman, head of sales at Metropole, to talk about sustainable fashion, and finally Julia Seidel uh, on to talk about a trip she recently took to Milan before the coronavirus took hold in northern Italy. Welcome, everyone, to the dispatch. Thank you. Welcome. Simon, uh, you are first up today. Um, what in, so in the spring edition, you wrote a piece uh, the Machi called the Machiavelli of Peace, a book review. What's the reputation of, ha of Austrian Habsburg diplomat Clemens von Metternich? You quote Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, Kissinger's homage on the challenge for diplomats, which I enjoyed quite a lot, being the quagmire of how diplomats maintain a semblance of order through the balance of fear, cooperation, and defensive mechanisms. What often happens with historical figures, of course, is that their reputation changes over time. They have one reputation when they're alive and well, friends and enemies. Their reputation depends on whether their friends or the enemies came out on top. Mm -hmm. And then when it's 100 years or 200 years ago, the historians start to assemble a kind of mosaic picture. Um, they may be negative, they may be positive, and the readers have the fun because they can pick and choose and put something together. What's happened in the case of Metternich, <clears throat> let's just show everybody what he looks like, I think. Are we on camera? Yes, you can see that. That's Perfect. the great man. Yeah. Um, as I understand from Austrian friends, every Austrian school child learns in elementary history books that this was a dangerous and maybe bad man. He ran an ironclad state he introduced for the time, early 19th century, an extremely efficient secret police force. Uh, if you fell afoul of it, uh, you were in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Stasi, Gestapo, uh, KGB, in that tradition. Uh, stories, I think, in the, in the simple school books for young kids tell rather gleefully how in the popular uprising in 1848, when the city was essentially taken over from the inside by the citizens rebelling against imperial rule, Metternich as the uh, main, main servant of the emperor, the main enforcer of the emperor's rule had to be smuggled out of the city in a laundry basket. Um, so at that point, his reputation was down. Mm -hmm. What's happened recently uh, is that he has gradually been rehabilitated, reputational repair. Uh, early 20th century biographies 
from a very Germanic point of view, still painted him as not a real German because he was putting together uh, an imperial federation of Slavs and Italians and Hungarians and a few German speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the- An inclusive early, Europe, it sounds like. Yeah, one of the early key biographies from a man called uh, von Sprick, who was a, a real blood and guts uh, Germanic heroic historian. For him, Metternich was far too multiculti. Mm -hmm. Recently, of course, multiculti is where it's at. Um, this the uh, biography is called Strategist and Visionary, and that says everything. Mm -hmm. It repaints, rebuilds a picture of Metternich mm -hmm. as a man really ahead of his time. He understood the intricacies of power politics. That power politics, politics was not just about soldiers and guns, who had the most troops, who had the most cannons, but it was a delicate balance. Real, the real warfare was behind the scenes mm -hmm. in the salons, the diplomats negotiating with each other. The, and that's what the famous Machiavellian notion of diplomacy, I think, yeah. A lot of the mm -hmm. audience is, it gets excited about that notion. I, I wanted to ask you about the power of interpretation, uh, especially historical revisionism in that sense. But um, why, why, why did this specific no, uh, version of or biography of, of, of Metternich come out when it did? And, and, and what was specifically new about it? What was new about, about Seaman's book is he had, as the first historian, access to private papers of Metternich that had only been recently discovered. Mm -hmm. They'd been lying in a trunk for years and years in the family's Schloss, Chateau, uh, in the Rheingau, uh, overlooking the, the Rhine River in Germany. And for some reason, no one's quite sure why, they'd been overlooked. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly had this treasure trove. He, uh, he compared it to the first guys into Tutankhamun's tomb, okay. seeing things that had been hidden away for ages, and suddenly, of course, like opening a window, a whole extra uh, view of Metternich's semi-private life. You have to remember that in those days, diplomacy was not per Zoom, not even per jet aircraft. Mm -hmm. Diplomacy meant a convoy of nine carriages trundling across rough countryside, trying to avoid hostile troops. Um, it was quite an undertaking in itself. And this book, among many other things, has fascinating glimpses into the, the everyday logistics and hardships of shuttle diplomacy, as Kissinger later described it, mm -hmm. shuttle diplomacy in those days. Could you, could you tell us maybe a, a quick personal story that came you know, from, from, from this new account that, we, that they had found? What exactly made Metternich into the master and, and myth that, that we hear so much about today? Uh, one of the intriguing things was how young he became involved in serious politics. His father was plenipotentiary, me, essentially means major minister acting for the Austrian Empire okay. in what was then the Austrian Netherlands, uh, today Belgium. Uh, the French Revolution had just happened. France was expansive and aggressive, and they tried to move in to what was Austrian territory, Spanish-Austrian territory. Uh, they were beaten back by the Austrian military up there. And his father had the delicate job of trying to cobble together a peace. And young wow. Metternich, still a teenager. What a premonition. Uh, with his, officially his secretary. Mm -hmm. So he was in there right uh, on the scene, observing, hearing, seeing the great people, the great powers who moved things at very close quarters. And he records that in great detail. Fascinating stuff. That's amazing. Uh, a, a major highlight of the book is the interrogation of his relationship with Napoleon. They weren't simply adversary, adversaries vying for dominance and the future of Europe they bonded over intellect. As you wrote, Metternich said of Napoleon, he's a good listener, quick to comprehend and predict consequences, not hostile, but no sentiment, a born conqueror and an administrator. 
was a pretty f strong, firm, but also very fair words to you know convey to a, about an adversary. <clears throat> this, is, this is fascinating stuff. Um, is history made by people or is history social, economic, and all these boring but sort of important groundswell things? Mm -hmm. And what this book does is, in a way, take us back to the old fashioned view of politics. It's actually people, usually powerful men, single individuals who, between them, shape the course of history. And these two men, Napoleon representing aggressive revolutionary France, he had a concept of a, a Pax Napoleana, of the entire mm -hmm. Central Europe being under his thumb. He would put relatives, friendly generals into key positions as princes and even kings in territories he conquered. So he had a, a personal vision of how he wanted Europe to be run by him. Metternich was his main opponent. Austria was not alone. Austria was in close alliance with Russia and Prussia, the other two main continental powers. They didn't always agree with each other. So Metternich had an incredibly complicated balancing job with his two main allies, a very egotistical young Russian czar and a very military aggressive Prussian king. He had to hold the alliance together and he had to negotiate with Napoleon. Uh, the two men seem to have struck up a very special relationship. Not surprising that it was special because they spent so much time together. There were so many conferences in these shifting alliances. At one time, Napoleon was threatening the Austrians. The other time, the alliance was threatening Napoleon. And threats, of course, as we know from modern day media politics, threats are part of the game, mm -hmm. but they're often not as real as they appear to be. The reality is behind the scenes, the, these men with a couple of bottles of wine probably on the table, sorting stuff out so face to face. Con considering so much of this new account, this new biography uh, was written based off of notes and letters that he, he wrote himself, um, you know, how much of that can be chalked up to subjectivity? Of course, one wouldn't innately assume their writings are going to be then told for, you know, centuries to come but ultimately they have been and it has created a very nuanced portrayal you know of of diplomacy the Habsburg empire the you know demise of napoleon and the peace in europe you know these are big themes huge topics you know hinging it all on a on his own account is there a threat in that have people raised questions about how accurate these accounts be or maybe if it's a subjective portrayal but it doesn't necessarily sound so controversial to the point where um they, they, they wouldn't take it seriously either. This is interesting because this again is a, a, a point where the various biographies of Metternich over the last decades, since let's say the beginning of the, of the 20th century, have varied. Earlier biographies portrayed him as a, a vain, glory-seeking person, um, really someone like perhaps another president we could mention at the moment, someone who was intent on spinning stuff so that he looked good. Mm -hmm. um, certainly his portraits show a rather good looking dandy. So that description sort of seemed credible. Um, it was probably unfair. It was probably wrong. He took meticulous notes, uh, meeting notes. He had secretaries, of course, but he wrote an extraordinary amount of detailed accounting himself of what happened, who said what, what was agreed, and so on. Um, and this is objective stuff, mm -hmm. looked at in the cooler light of day by the new biography, Siemens biography. Um, it doesn't show a vain person spinning his own performance. Certainly. It shows someone who is really a nuts and bolts negotiator, getting the facts, mm -hmm. using them as a basis. He was a tough negotiator. He wasn't as physically uh, imposing as Napoleon, who was built like a Serbian uh, bodyguard and 
behaved often in meetings like a Serbian bodyguard on mm -hmm. a bad night. Uh, Metternich was cool and elegant, the uh, consummate aristocrat. Mm -hmm. So the two were uh, unequal but equal adversaries. Different styles, but they were head-to-head -head equals. So my, my last question for you, Simon, and thanks so, so much so far. Um, in, in his letters, in his personal notes, he hadn't mentioned the Congress of Vienna uh, in, at, at length, something that at least historical books and accounts would suggest is the major feat of his career in life, you know, building the foundations for peace across Europe. Um, yeah, in 1815. What, uh, why is that? Why, why do, we, do we have a sense of why he hadn't mentioned that in his notes? Um, in, his, in his personal notes, he left a very clear reason. He said, the Congress was meticulously documented. I don't have to tell it all over again. And it was typical for him. He was both the host, because the Congress of Vienna, of course, mm -hmm. took place in Vienna. He was also easily the, the leading force. He was the one who would move, as it were, from salon to salon, Kissinger style, mm -hmm. um, extracting um, concessions from one party or another and then putting them together. Um, this was all, of course, documented um, and the results essentially shaped the map of Europe for the rest of the 19th century from 1815 to, uh, to the wars at the beginning of the 20th century. So he didn't feel the need to, uh, to, to rewrite it. It had been done as far as he was concerned. Well, thanks so much, Simon, for both your piece in the spring edition. Um, I read it with eager eyes earlier. I find him a, ma a fascinating historical figure and, and spent a lot of time thinking about diplomacy today. So, so thanks for that and, and, today's, and coming on today's show. And we'll be speaking with you later. Um, but for those of you who just tuned in, this is the Metropole Dispatch, Metropole's quarantine live stream. And tonight we're hosting Metropole's April Salon, which would normally be taking place in person. Our guests contributed to the spring edition of the magazine on everything from rhetoric uh, of right-wing populism to wine and sustainable fashion. I'm still collecting questions so, for, for everyone, so please feel free to drop them in the comment section. Um, I guess now we'll pivot over to Dardis, uh, Dardis McNamee, our editor-in-chief at Metropole. For, Dardis, for the spring edition's Gemischte Satz, and Gemischte Satz is a piece of the magazine that we, we publish each, each, each edition, which refers to the local Viennese wine made from several grape varieties grown, harvested, and fermented together, typically in Vienna. Um, you, you interviewed prominent Austrian academic and author Ruth Vodak, uh, Emeritus Distinguished Professor and Chair in Discourse Studies in the Linguistics Department at Lancaster University, and also a Professor of Linguistics at the University of Vienna. Um, to, to speak about her life and book, The Politics of Fear, Right-Wing Populism, uh, right Populism Discourses, or what Right-Wing Populism Discourses mean. That's close enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Ruth is an extraordinary person. She's, uh, she was the part of a, of a group of women in the 1970s at the University of Vienna uh, who were often the first professors in their department, the first woman professors in their departments ever in the history of the university. And she, in fact, was the first uh, Jewish full professor in the entire university in the post-war era. Um, and so she was uh, carving out terrain from the very first. And I love these stories about her because uh, she was a bit of a troublemaker. I, uh, Good. Uh, you and I discussed. Uh, she, um, she, and these women got together, and they, they, they put out a book. They decided, okay, we're academics. If we want to get someone's attention, we've got to publish a book. Mm -hmm. So they put together a book of essays called "Das Ewige Cliché," the eternal cliché. In other words, the way you all look at us is the eternal cliché, and we're going to do something about it. And so she said, well, when they were first got there at the 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 political mood was the, there was a lot of pressure to have a token woman in every department. So they got their token woman in every department. And uh, she said, well, it was clear from the departmental meetings that the men thought they were gonna be just 
secretaries, but better secretaries, like secretaries with PhDs, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were supposed to get the coffee and they were supposed to organize, take the minutes for the meetings. And and so- A rather degrading version of a PhD, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, uh, so they, but they all sort of got together as a group in this following group at the mm -hmm. University of Bean, and they all said, you know what? We're not gonna do that. So they just, as a group across the board throughout the university said, no. And of course, this created a bit of an uproar uh, for which they got some gratifying publicity and they considered it and they announced this to the public and to the media. And they said, we're starting on a re-education program <laughs> okay. among the faculty at the university. So that's, this is Ruth. She's got a lovely sense of humor and she takes on monumental challenges, you know, with enormous, uh, cool and good, you know, positive energy, a lovely wit and uh, always a good a good laugh, but uh, of course they've made huge changes. And the fact that uh, several of the um, of the departments of the university now have the w first women they've ever had as the rectors of those institutes is just an enormous uh, change in those years. And she was one of the first. And it sounds really important to look into her historical experience to understand also what she's writing about today. Um, yeah. What does Professor Vodak mean by the rhetoric of far-right populism? And what is the legacy of this term in, in time, but also in Austria? Yes, well, she, so she was sort of coming into her own as a scholar uh, in the 1980s, which in Austria was a very pivotal time. This was the time in 1986 of the, what's called the Kurt Waldheim affair. Sure. The Waldheim affair. Mm -hmm. Kurt Waldheim was at the time a candidate for presidency of the Republic, and he had been previously the Secretary General of the UN. And it turned out that he had concealed and sort of papered over with a with a, basically a a gap, a, a part of his career in the Wehrmacht during the war where he was associated with a, events where in the chain of command of possible war crimes. And it was blurry enough that it wasn't really clear whether he had actually been responsible for any of these things or not, but he, he had never said anything about it. He'd actually claimed he was back in Vienna going to university at the time or something else. He had some other excuse why he wasn't there. Uh, when in fact he was. So this became a bit of an uproar, but it was it was also exactly uh, 50 years after 1938 in 1977, 19, 1987-88, when there had been enough of a generational shift that the country somehow could allow itself to start talking about things that had been just nobody could face, nobody could talk about. Um, and con conflicts within families, uh, uh, children who had grown up with parents who never talked to them, uh, who refused to talk about the war. These, all these kinds of enormously painful things mm -hmm. started coming out at this time. So Ruth thought I got very interested in the way the conversation was taking place. And it became a very uh, nationalistic thing because Waldheim, for instance, was put on a watch list by the United States and he wasn't allowed to come into the country. Wow. This is the man who had been the Secretary General. Exactly, of the one of the larger so, promoters of peace. And right. So, so Austrians, so one of the reactions was that people got very defensive. And mm -hmm. so, this was the beginning of Austria for the Austrians in the public discourse and the very, very early stages of. Of, of that movement. Then 1990 happened, uh, 1989, 1990, and the end of, of the East-West parallel in Austria that had been the, this terribly important buffer zone for the West on the edge of Eastern Europe with so many communist countries on its borders going all around, suddenly had lost its very important position. And so a whole a whole lot of things started to bubble to the surface that had been kept under a lid mm -hmm. during that time. And so she began to notice that it began to be we, they. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, that was the beginning of Austria for the Austrians and the beginning of the career of Jörg Haider, who uh, was the, became the spokesperson for the Austrian Freedom Party um, that, that with whose power in the 80s was still small, but as we all know, in more recent years, sure. has become pretty powerful and twice part of the government. Mm -hmm. um, 
scary stuff, but also really interesting to see its origins and how you know complicated, yeah. but also important that past is. So Vodak emphasizes in, in, in your interview the por- importance of the politics of exclusion, preferring yeah. the French version where no religious, for example, where no religious symbols are allowed in public schools at all, whereas in Austria they uh, simply don't allow Muslim symbols. So you have a kind of prioritization oh. here uh, of one religion <laughs> over another in the public space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, she she's very... Um, sensitive to this. Uh, she's herself a, um, a reformed Jew, uh, non-practicing really, uh, but but of a Jewish cultural heritage. And she's also part of the generation that had left and come back. And so they're returned, family of returned Jews. So she she notices very clearly that, uh, that Austria, which is still you know, a a Catholic, formerly Catholic country still has crosses in the classrooms and, um, and they're very, very careful not to tread on the, on the practices of, of, of uh, Orthodox or Reformed Jews. And so people can wear, uh, you know, uh, clothing, articles of clothing like a kippah, the cap that uh, men wear, Jewish men wear, uh, that represent the religion without, uh, being discriminated against, but the whole saga of the headscarf then mm-hmm. takes on a different meaning because, well, why this one and not the other ones? And so her argument is the French, this is one area where the French got it right, where they say in school, in public schools, there it should all be uh, uh, the laity. And so there should be no religious symbols of any kind from any religion, and that way we're fair. Mm-hmm. And so she's suggesting that Austria should consider doing that and just, and of course you can have a private school. If you have a school that's run by, owned and run by the church, they do what they like. Or if you, another kind of a private school can be owned by the, you know, the Jew, the Jewish community has its own gymnasia that are, you know, Hebrew schools and they can run, have theirs their, their own way. But the state schools, her argument is, should be lay schools, mm-hmm. should have no religious symbols at all. Certainly relevant to this conversation on, you know, the separation of church and state, which I know in the United States is a very firm dialogue, albeit imperfect in terms of it slipping into the, the public sphere more often than we would like to think. Before, before I, we move on to the next, uh, to Philip, I wanted to ask you, because this is so relevant to journalism and our practice at Metropole, um, that in the, in the piece you reference the public sphere um, and you know, the public sphere being, you know, the notion of public debate of, of you know, civic participation and, um, and, and elections and these things. You, in, in the overabundance of content that we're seeing today, and, and you quote that politicians are now, are, are, so, so our politicians are now their own journalists, that they don't need the media. Uh, what is the th- threat of this kind of shift or change in, in the public sphere to, to democracy? Yeah, I think the, the question is is uh, a really good one. It's a very fundamental one. But the question is whether the whether the politicians, like the man who shall remain nameless, doesn't think he needs the media and is his own through his own Twitter feed is going to mm. to represent himself. I think I don't see in any way that this uh, removes the role of the media. It just means that he's got a Hyde Park corner. Uh, on his Twitter feed, and this becomes the raw material of what journalism is, which is to to help the public understand um, the politics or the changes of the the evolution. But there is one more um, thing that's so relevant for this question today in the the politics of exclusion that we need that is the thing that particularly in the time of a coronavirus where we're all living in a sense in a state of of background fear you know we all we're all uh staying home we're all wearing our masks we're all keeping our distance and everything Mm -hmm. because we know that there's a real risk right outside the door that we can't see it uh and so what vodak raises and why this book is so important it's it's about to come out in a new edition in the fall which is only a few years from the first edition because so much has happened in between you know the my migration wave in 2015, uh, Brexit, Donald Trump, uh, uh, and the uh, Viktor Orban and the uh, you know right wing shifts in Poland. So, the, and all of these things share certain common features, and it's about 
the instrumentalization, the use by the far right of people's fear as a way to get them to hand over power mm. to the central authority, which sets itself up as the thing that's going to protect them from whatever this terrible fear is. And in the case of the far right populism, they use it to sell a politics of nostalgia, for instance, with Brexit for some you know, glorious period in the past that we're going to reclaim and we're all gonna live in, in little brigadoons or something like this in these little perfect English villages. Um, and, and then in, in Hungary or Poland for this nostalgia for a nation state that actually never really existed. But so the politics of fear in the context of the Corona crisis is, you know, and this has been a theme in Austria uh, almost every day in the papers that there's, that we've given over civil rights to the central government right now uh, out of, because we need to cooperate with each other in order to fight against this virus and the spread of this virus, but it's really important that those powers be given back to the public when the crisis is over. And there are a lot of people who, who worry that the politics of fear could be instrumentalized, maybe not here, maybe not in Austria, but in many countries as a way to take on greater power mm -hmm. central government uh, because of people's you know, inability to deal with this alone. And it seems like there could be in these times a new edition of this book annually coming out. Uh, but I think, you know, for everyone out there, um, Ruth will be coming to the salon if and when uh, uh, we ever end up engaging in public discourse again, physically speaking, um, I think in October at, at the yes, salon. So we've scheduled it for October. The book comes, the new edition comes out in September. Mm -hmm. And so assuming all is back more or less to normal, we will be hosting uh, Ruth at that time. And uh, you'll have a chance to, to hear her and ask her questions in person. She's an absolutely extraordinary person. And, and to give peace to the uh, audience here, Maggie had said, I think we can't deny politicians the direct connection to the public. Twitter, at street, live stream, uh, et, et cetera. And they will campaign and lie and say stupid things, but it's up to us to help our readers understand what it means for them. Absolutely, that's what we're here to do today. Um, and that's why we also field questions from the audience to make, to make our members feel a part of the journalism itself. Well, um, they are a part. Absolutely. So for all of the, for those of you who just tuned in, this is the Metropole Dispatch, Metropole's quarantine live stream. And tonight we are hosting Metropole's April Salon, um, absent our physical presence, which would normally be the case. Our guest tonight contributed to the spring edition of the magazine on everything from uh, the rhetoric of right-wing populism to wine and sustainable fashion. I'm still collecting questions and comments, so feel free to add them to the comment feed. Philip, welcome. Um, nice to have you on here. So Philip is our head of sales at Metropole and frequent contributor to the magazine and digital edition. Um, and for this particular issue, you interviewed Mark Bajent, if I'm saying that correct. Yes. Well, I mean, this was to launch um, a new a new um, section of the magazine that we'll have with, with each coming issue now. Um, a fashion, a fashion editorial that will focus on um, whatever topic is relevant to the issue. And for Minds of Vienna, we took a look at what's innovative in fashion. And of course, you can't really um, talk about innovation in fashion and not talk about sustainability, even though that does, does mean something else in, in whatever context you view it. Because usually when we say sustainability, we usually talk about the environment, mm -hmm. but that's the sustainability doesn't have to be about the environment necessarily because the, the root of the word is an ability to sustain something. Mm -hmm. So for an industry to be sustainable, it has to sustain itself. Um, and coincidentally with fashion, this is a very largely an environmental issue because fast fashion is moving way too fast and it's, it is wasteful and it does neglect a lot of guidelines that, you know, will benefit our, our, um, our planet. So, um, but it, it's not, it's not just that. And so what Mark, what Mark is, is doing in terms of sustainability or his prim primary focus, um, and I found that really eye-opening in our conversation is that mm -hmm. he's really 
putting his focus on um, fair wages and the fair treatment of his workers. So, I mean, for everybody who doesn't know, Mark is um, a Viennese designer mm -hmm. who a couple of years ago um, moved his business to Bali where he is able to really run it in a very, for him, sustainable way. Um, as great as Vienna is uh, for small business owners and especially businesses in the creative sector, it's, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of, um, a lot of bricks in the way to, to uh, getting your business off the ground, especially for young designers, it's really difficult. In Bali, he has the means to have his own um, production factory, to have, mm -hmm. um, I think, 30 employees. I don't know how many people he employs. It's in the magazine. Yeah, I think it's uh, in the, yeah. uh, to, to really run a, a business there. And, and for, for you know, Indonesia standards, he pays them exceedingly well. They all have, they all get their days off. They work from Mondays to Fridays, nine to five. Mm -hmm. They all, he pays them benefits for the entire family, for the entire household. And I mean, unheard of standards it's, or it's, very high standards for, for Indonesia, which for us, I mean, would be, would be um, commonplace. But it sounds like um, a massive effort he's taking to really, you know, set the tone on what actual sustainability means, how it's defined. And, you know, my impression of, of this is that, you know, through time, it's been this conversation between um, the consumer and the, and the producer. And only until instances like the 2013 collapse of the uh, apparel um, factory in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where over like 1,300 people were killed, you know, producing um, bags and, 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 and lines for everyone from Versace to Gucci. Um, you know, it really struck home at the global nature of, of, of fashion, right? It doesn't just show up in the streets and promenades of Milan or Vienna, for that matter. Um, uh, you know, from nowhere. And, and that conversation is confronted everyone from Nike to H&M and their models are changing dramatically based off of that. I know Zara is taking massive leaps to, uh, to try to not have any, um, well, certain levels of abuses. But I guess my question for you is, you know, it sounds like Mark is trying to play a major role in defining what sustainability is. Um, you know, how, how much of that conversation is just still in flux and, and what do consumers think about that? Well, I mean, we do notice um, a shift in this whole paradigm, right? That consumers are paying more and more attention to what's happening and mm -hmm. we do. It's, it's, this, it's this consciousness that comes in and um, we, we do have to, to you know, struggle with the fact that if we do buy something that's fast fashion, often we do feel bad about it. So that's, I think that's the, that's a step in the right direction is to sort of our conscience really taking over and, and being more mindful about what we buy and where we buy it from and buying locally. And also, I mean, I have, have made um, a change to buying more vintage pieces, um, not exclusively, but just Same buying then. something that's that's been here before and also that's also lasted mm -hmm. over time and that's you know that speaks for its quality um and really quality over quantity is um going to be the major thing we all have to we all have to focus on mm -hmm. but um what's also really important is not to not to fall you know victim to this to this greenwashing that the companies are Absolutely. doing we a lot of companies having these conscious collections and, and, and having organic this and organic that and fairly produced, um, those are buzzwords. And often these certificates don't really mean anything. Sure. They, they are bought and they, you have to fulfill a, a certain number of criteria, but just because something says it's conscious doesn't really mean that, that that's the case or that is, that is entirely fair. So I guess what it means is what it means for every individual consumer is put in some research mm -hmm. and um, also think about yourself. Do I need this? Do I need to have this? Uh, is this something that's going to last a long time? Is this going to be a staple piece or is this just something that's disposable? Mm -hmm. And also to, it's also important to learn how to take care of your clothes. I, I know a lot of people who don't know how to use a washing machine properly and who have no idea how to wash their garments and they, they wash them once or twice and they're ruined sure. because they think, you know, you have to wash everything at a really high temperature or they just don't know what their, what their washing machine does. So I think that's, that also plays a, a huge part in, in this sort of 
yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I won't admit to the amount of red hues that are in my white white button downs here, but it's it's it's. Uh, <laughs> it's I think I, I need another lesson, Philip. But it's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question of how vigilant the consumer can and should be. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, in the context of coronavirus that we're all sitting in in isolation here, you know, what like what are the benefits of paying attention to how you look? Um, for example, I mean, you know, I was, out, I was in the conversation with my dad yesterday and he, you know, he's managing a whole team and was leading a Zoom call as well. And, you know, a couple of people forgot to turn off their Zoom video while they were, you know, disheveled in their, you know, in their living rooms doing things that they probably wouldn't have done in the office setting, let's just say. You know, what are those, those like, what, what is the sort of benefit of, 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 of dressing up and, yeah, retaining, I guess, sort of an idea of fashion? I mean, I guess, I guess it, it depends, you know, you're in this, in this sort of mindset and you feel differently, you feel a little more like yourself mm. and it feels, and it takes you out of your, your comfort zone at home because what's, you know, what's um, a potential, a potential trap here is that you might be getting very comfortable and then you merge your work life and your private life a little too much and you don't have these boundaries. So by still dressing up for things, you retain a sense of yourself and of your regular life. Mm -hmm. But um, I think Corona poses a lot, a lot more severe uh, changes to, um, to fashion and to, to the way people dress than just um, deciding to dress up for, for fun or to, to, to keep some sanity. Mm. Because what's the, I mean, the fashion industry, I think is gonna be one of the industries that's, that's gonna be affected the most by this. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna have to re regroup and, and really reevaluate how they want to go forward after this crisis is over. Or, um, you know, years, years and years and years later, just uh, to deal with these repercussions. Mm -hmm. This is really something that, they, that they're not gonna be able to bounce back from that, that fast. We were already faced with um, a need to innovate and to change. And now this has been accelerated like crazy. A, a Vanguard Voyager asked, where, where is your, where's your shirt from? I've, I have no idea, I don't know. I can, I can look later. I, Okay, um, That's, uh, we'll get back to you, Vanguard Voyager. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to, what, my last question for you is, is you know, what what are the new fashions in coronavirus? I know, in, you know, what are, is is are v, is Vienna building out anything in particular? Are you know, is sustainability a part of this question? Well, I mean that is that is that is a, a question. That's a point I raised um, in the introductory piece in the in the magazine. Mm -hmm. Um, the industry is changing and a lot of the industry is very traditional still in the way that it works and churning out looks and, and these big brands have to churn out four to six collections a year and it's all going, everybody's going crazy. It's 80 looks per collection now and, and it's just insane and it's a house of cards that's, you know, bound to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is really where Vienna may, might have... Um, uh, might really have an advantage because Viennese fashion has been either very avant-garde for many, many years. But what you see with popular designers in Vienna is that their fashion isn't that bound to trends um, and doesn't take that many leaps. So essentially, it's a little bit more timeless. And a lot of people do have um, staple pieces and permanent pieces in their collections. Um, here in Vienna, and it's a lot of the popular designers. So that that might be really the the way forward in making sustainable fashion is also making something that lasts, not just quality wise, but also in the in the way how it looks. Mm -hmm. So now this is going to be the real the real driving force going forward to make things that last. And I think Vienna is is innovative enough there that people don't really pay huge attention to the, the, the very, very latest trends. I mean, of course, those people are here and, and they exist and they do spend an enormous amount of money on, on things that will just look good for a season or two. But the overall, the people who do who make the fashion and who know the fashion here are a little more um, conscious of that anyway. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm glad to see there's room for optimism in the fashion scene in Vienna. Uh, Phil, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. For those of you who just tuned in, this is the Metropole Dispatch, Ma Metropole's quarantine live stream, and tonight we're hosting Metropole's April Salon. 
Ben, thanks for your comment about the new format. I think it's pretty cool too. Unfortunately, it'll be better in person. Um, our guest tonight contributed to the spring edition of the magazine on everything from the rhetoric of right-wing populism to wine and sustainable fashion. I'm still collecting questions and comments, so please do ask them in the comment feed. Um, Julia, Julia Seidel is a, uh, supports Metropole's online uh, content as alongside our editorial newsletters. Um, and for this edition, you took a ride uh, on a train for your story. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Hey, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Well, so this was the travel story, right? So we wanted to do it a little bit different this time, um, not just show a place, mm -hmm. but uh, actually show, well, the journey, the way, how to get there. Um, Greta Thunberg, um, still big in the news, but we don't hear so much from her right now. But um, back at that time, um, everybody was also talking about her and um, people were thinking about taking more trains instead of, of airplanes to go to places, right? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to, to adapt to that and to have our, our travel story to be um, this journey to a very interesting place. Um, yeah, we chose, <laughs> we chose Milan for that. So um, it was good to be there <laughs> before, before everything started so so tell me a little bit about the uh, the actual train you guys took it was uh a, this new urbe bay jet the austrian bond system mm -hmm. the austrian train system yeah well so the idea is is that it's more more friendly like for the environment and yeah that it takes you longer to get somewhere mm -hmm. but to not see like traveling only as, okay, I'm getting from A to B, but as, as an experience. So um, it was also the first time for me, I think. So <laughs> it was quite new. Um, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. In fact, um, you know, there was this, um, well, Schaffner, <laughs> as we say, uh, like our personal Schaffner. Chauffeur. Who, uh, Chauffeur, yeah, he, he welcomed us and he and he he took our luggage and he showed us to our room mm -hmm. and um, and said that he would be there if we needed anything. So it was a very personal experience, um, also with him. And then, well, the cabin itself, it's it's really small, like it's it's really really small. I mean, we didn't have like a luxury one; it was uh, a standard. Mm -hmm. So next time, the, yeah, right. Next time. I mean, I, it's funny when I think about night jets and, and, and sort of overnight trains, I think of history, right? You know, I'm, I'm reading a book by Rebecca West who wrote this amazing uh, travel account in the thirties, 1930s about sort of a trip through the Balkans, right? Through the Weimar era. Um, and, you know, everything is, is, is in these beautiful, uh, you know, overnight cars where you, you know, go through the Alps. And, you know, I think we all saw the Grand Budapest Hotel. There's a few train seas in there, which, of course, are very provocative, but nothing we really associate with our contemporary environment, which leads me. Ah, uh, Maggie corrected me. It's Schiffner is conductor. OK, but. It sounds like it was someone who was helping you get along. So I assumed it was chauffeur. A new vocabulary. Yeah, you know, every day we learn something new here in German or English. Um, yeah, and it, it, it sort of begs the question for me, like, I mean, tra air travel has just become so efficient. It's cheap. It's, you know, Ryanair, EasyJet. They're, they're inexpensive options to spend an hour getting from Vienna to Berlin, Vienna to... Uh, Madrid, London. Um, yeah. What's you know? What do you think it's going to take to draw people into this into train travel? Um, I do think that people will and would enjoy train travel a lot mm -hmm. um, because it uh, it kind of gives you the chance to switch off also. So because the <laughs> it's an advantage now the VLAN and the UBB, the Wi-Fi is. Um, not too good so you can't be on your phone all the time oh, yeah, so you have to, so but but you you go to bed at like eight or nine or something so all of a sudden you have so much time to do like to talk to the person you're traveling with maybe or to read 
read a book finally or a, um, a, a spring edition of the magazine or do that exactly <laughs> no, um, but so but the, the big but um yeah it's still very expensive so mm -hmm. i do think that this can still be this, this this one step that keeps people from doing that more um because i I looked it up and I think the the plane ticket would have cost us 50 or 60 bucks or something like that in both directions. And the train ticket was um, way more mm. uh, expensive. And we even, we met this, um, a mother and a daughter in a restaurant in Milan and they were Austrians. Like we, we sat at the table in a, rest, in a restaurant and beside us were two Austrians. And um, so of really. course, we formed like this, this, this bigger table together and we basically had dinner together mm -hmm. and they told us that they took um, a plane and we were like, oh yeah, well, we took the train. And, but they only came because they found this very, very cheap flight, which, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I don't think you should, um, one should be like too, too critical about that. Like, I mean, if, if somebody finds like a cheap flight to go somewhere, of course you, yeah you're happy about that right and um i've also taken a very cheap trip to new york before but yeah. um it helps to be a little bit more conscious about it and to look for mm. alternatives yeah yeah it's 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 always a, a, a i mean a nice luxury definitely i mean mag uh, vanguard voyager was say, saying in the comment section that you can get a lot more done on the train and i, I agree there's no security I've, totally. I've flown way too much in my life and you're constantly in the middle of security moving around you can't sit still um it's not a very patient experience but and also it could be a conversation starter it's you know there's, there's a fair point to that yes yeah i think there um there are cabins where you can like um sleep in the same cabin as, as strangers like as people that you don't know there's also but there's also female only um cabins yeah um but still i, I think i would prefer to travel with somebody that um I know just because it's more comfortable and because you're very close together. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, list, just listen to some music, you know, just look out of the window and have your, your TV show moment. It's, mm. it's nice. So my, my last question for you before we move on to the last segment here is about your impression of Milan. I guess it was what, two weeks before the coronavirus hit the Lombardy region, which has been the sort of hot spot for the Italian coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, yeah, it was about one to two weeks. We were there at the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, we went to the Duomo, to the cathedral in, in Milan, and so the Castello. Um, and there were so many people there, right? And to see it now on the on the TV and being like being so empty it, it, it feels very strange and very yeah uh, surreal of course sure. um we yeah we had some nice encounters with people in 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 milan like i, I still remember this guy um mark he, he was named marco like the italian guy was called marco <laughs> um and he was our our guide for the free walking tour mm -hmm. right so and it was a two or three hours tour and he, right at the beginning he, he picked up like a piece of paper that flew around on the on the street and just picked it up and put it into the trash and was like sure why not but he kept doing that for the entire tour he, everything that he saw every piece of trash that he saw on the street he would just pick it up and throw it away and he, he never mentioned it he never um, spoke about that. I don't know if he wanted to get more tips or because he was really that. Um, Let's assume it was for the conscious. environment. Yeah. So that that kind of uh, stuck with me. It's it's just a nice. Um, mm. Cool. Yeah, memory. <laughs> well, no, it's it's an it's nice to hear that. Absolutely, in positive memories, I can take us a long way when yeah. we spend all of our time indoors here. Um, and it's yeah, nice to hear that. Well, yeah, I mean, for everyone out there, it's a com it's a sort of trade-off between the environment price point, you know, time efficiency, but um, I'll certainly try out one of these night trains. Uh, not sure it'll be my routine travel method, but uh, I'm excited. Where would you go? 
Where would I go? I mean, I, I'm I, admittedly I'm a fan of 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 of, of, of Italy, but uh, I I really want to go towards the Balkans. I want to I don't know mm -hmm. head to yeah Bulgaria, uh, Croatia, that coastline. I'm I'm reading about it right now through the eyes of a, a, a travel reporter in the 1920s and 30s. So it's captivated me. That's that's my next step. Jules, thanks so much for coming on, taking the yep, time. Yeah, sure. Thank you. See you tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who just tuned in, this is the Metropole Dispatch, Metropole's quarantine live stream. And tonight we are hosting Metropole's April Salon, uh, an event we would normally hold in person and talking about everything from right-wing populism to sustainable fashion and wine. Uh, still collecting questions and comments, so please add them to the section. Uh, Simon, thanks for sticking around. Um, we're going to pivot in this last segment to a new subject, though. Your last piece in the in the uh, spring edition called Tempter with a Wine Glass. Um, but before we talk about specifically the, the, the object of the piece, I wanted to know a little bit about Austrian's reputation for wine and how it's grown internationally. You mentioned that Grüne Veline, popular white wine, is in Manhattan, and I know it's not the same as you know the Hoyer experience in the the Viennese hills hillsides, um, but people like it, right, around the world. Um, Austrian wine for export, of course, ha has two problems. Um, it starts with what marketing people call uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, Everybody re recognizes a German beer is probably going to be good. Uh, an Italian cheese is probably going to be good and so on. French wine, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, people just don't know Austrian wines for the most part outside of sophisticated spots like New York City and the West Coast in the US and similar places. So that's the first barrier um, coupled to building awareness for Austria mm. is the old kangaroo problem. Exactly. Um, I spent a lot of the summer in upstate New York, okay. not sophisticated country, wine stores. And you go in and I always say, do you have any Austrian wine? Oh, yes. They Down say. under, right? They directly to a huge shelf of Australian yellowtail ah. with a beautiful golden kangaroo on it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one problem to get over. Okay. Um, the other part of the awareness problem is the names of the grapes. Um, most of the better wines nowadays are varietals, which means it's a, it's a wine made from one single grape. It's a Chardonnay or it's a Pinot Noir or whatever it is. <laughs> and that's good for Austrian, Austria because Austria's best wines for the most part are also single grape varieties. Mm -hmm. The famous Grunewald Lina that you mentioned. Um, and marketing, being successful in marketing is about being unique. So on the one side, Austria has its own unique grapes, which almost no one else, no one else has. Grunewald Lina, great white wine, uh, Zweigels, and Blaufränkisch, the great red wines. Um, so they're unique, but no one knows them. Um, Grunewald Lina has another problem, and that's simple pronunciation. Yeah. There is, a, there is a low price Austrian wine on the American markets with Gruner spelled G-R-O-O-N-E-R, just to make it clear. Yeah. Um, so that, those are the hurdles, that's the barrier. Um, but thanks to pretty intensive marketing over the last 10, 12 years, Austrian wines are gaining a foothold, mm -hmm. um, expressed in numbers, the volume of exported Austrian wine has not gone up much, okay. but the value has doubled. So that tells a good story. What the Austrians have been good at is selling their better wines. Selling better wines and for a higher price, it sounds like. Is, you know, exactly. does, does Austria, this is a quick technical question, have a, have a quantity problem by any means? Is there, a, it's not a huge geographic landmass. I mean, it's not small either, but, you know, are there the amount of wines like, that would be, you know, potentially demanded. I mean, either, is there an overstock, understock? Um, I asked because I was recently in, in Southern Tyrol, which <laughs> is not, no longer Austria, but it, 
it, they were producing a lot of apples, and you would see actually some 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 winemakers, vineyards, um, actually you know whip, ripping out the the apple trees to to make to make wine out of them because they were like the value is if you put the time in and effort and investment, which is not small, you know you can potentially make a killing off of this because this region's wines are becoming more important. That's a good question. Um, most Austrian wine is produced by relatively small growers. Yes. relatively small compared to the, the huge states in France and, and Italy and California. Um, what that means is the Austrians are probably never going to be able to supply um, major chain stores in the US, supermarkets where it's permitted or chain wine stores, because these retail outfits need a solid, reliable supply in large quantities. Um, but if, as the Austrians have been doing quite successfully, selling up the market, more expensive wines, then they're supplying restaurants, they're supplying smaller specialty stores, and there the, the quantities are probably enough. Mm -hmm. I, I spend a lot of time travel permitting before and after Corona um, out in the wine growing districts, hours drive from Vienna, 90% mm -hmm. of Austrian wine. Um, and many of the growers have done individual deals with a with an American importer or a British restaurant and so on. And they've got their small niche markets well established. Mm -hmm. um, it's never going to be the big volume. Sure. But that's not the issue. It's more important to make money. So I guess this, this brings me to the, the object of your piece in the spring edition um, with, in which you interviewed the, the wine and co wine and co-founder Willi Klinger. Um, Correct. Now the CEO, but he wasn't the founder. He was not the founder. Okay, he's the CEO. Okay. He, was a, he was a junior person when they founded it. At the outset. All right. Now he's the boss. And I, it sounds like the development and evolution of Vine & Co. was not always as smooth as every red wine, perhaps, that they're selling. Um, that's true. Uh, wine & Co., of course, is basically shops, retail. Mm -hmm. And retail is a brutally tough business. Um, it's in constant flux, Wine & Co. came up with an interesting concept, which most of us who live in Vienna know well, uh, pleasant experiences. Yeah, prime real estate. A huge selection of wines from all over the world, mm -hmm. not only Austrian, but all over the world. And you can taste everyone while you're there. You order a glass, sit at the table, eat a small snack perhaps with it. And uh, you can say, I like this one, I like that one less and you go home with a box of whichever one it is you like. So this is a pretty neat idea. Mm -hmm. Fits well for a, uh, a cool, urban, big city uh, public. And this is something that's obviously met, it's, 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 it's brief and, and, and under coronavirus, but you, you were on the phone with him yesterday, I believe. What, what was he saying about Correct. the... Mm -hmm. uh, um, corona, of course, has, has hit the business. Um, the good news for them, for Vine & Co., they also have a an online order and delivery system. Um, that has boomed, logically enough, in the last few weeks. They're now working three shifts round the clock, taking orders, packing, and delivering. Mm -hmm. uh, they've taken a hit, of course, with their retail business. The shops were closed until just a few days ago. They could technically have stayed open because they sell enough foodstuffs to qualify as, uh, as grocery. But they decided to close and make sure the staff stayed safe and so on. Now the numbers are going down and people are coming out of the woodwork a little bit. They are opening uh, as of yesterday, the 16th, uh, or today. As of today, right. Mm -hmm. They are opening most of their stores in Vienna. So uh, if you know Wine & Co, you can go back in. And if you don't, give them a try. Well, I'm not too far from one of their uh, fourth, no, fifth district uh, real estate, so I, I might have to go take advantage of that. Um, yeah, I guess one last question for you. I, um, you know, what innovations are you finding in the Austrian wine scene that are either adapting to the coronavirus itself or, or broadly that are putting it, in a, it on the market? And has Vine & Co. been a representation of that? Well, most, most of us who love wine are traditionalists. Okay. Um, so I hope there won't be many innovations. Wine, Austrian wine is pretty good as it is. 
Um, the business may never be quite the same again, the retail part of the mm. business. Um, of course, the coronavirus has uh, enormously benefited online. Uh, Klinger told me yesterday on the phone, he has a huge number of new customers delivering ordering online, which is not surprising. Mm -hmm. He expects to keep a number of the new customers. Um, so that's a wait and see, but it'll probably be a slight gain for a company which has a good online uh, ordering system when the corona fades. Uh, it shouldn't make any difference to the way my wine is made. He has a short term problem and that's labor for any kind of farming, grape farming is no exception, uh, is seasonal. You have intensive labor periods and less intensive labor periods. And a lot of the wine growers, they have people coming in from Czech Republic, across the border, Slovakia, Hungary, the neighboring countries. And uh, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. We've just been through a very intensive work period in the vineyards. Everything has to be pruned. That's handwork. Every vine is hand pruned back to the, uh, the two main uh, branches. Um, there'll be a lot of, a lot of handwork later in the season, cutting the leaves, let the sun in and so on. Uh, yeah, I had a delivery yesterday from Carl Brindlemeyer, uh -huh. uh, one of the growers out near Krems. Um, he's having a real trouble. He can get up very early in the morning himself and do work he would have hired to other people to do. Right. It's not just the fact that, you know, people aren't consuming it. It's that, you know, other parts of this uh, production process are just, you know, taking hits of labor shortages. We were we had a Hungarian political analyst on who spoke about border troubles between Hungary and Austria, considering the, oh, I'm going to mess this number up, but I think it was, yeah, there's a, a, tens of thousands of, of Hungarians living in, in Austria who may now be back in in. in, in in Hungary, and that you know is a labor shortage problem ultimately. So um, that doesn't mean we're not drinking well, wine. <laughs> coming back, coming back to the business part, if I may, for a second. Go ahead. Uh, the smaller growers are largely dependent on selling to restaurants and cafes. Ah, that's right. They're not in a position to supply big supermarket chains, um, and that business, of course, has taken a huge hit. And even when it comes back to normal. Nobody is going to eat two dinners a day just to make up for lost time. Yeah, that's business that's lost forever. Yeah, well, we're we're um, hoping that the restaurants in Vienna will be at back up soon and we can enjoy their wine. It sounds like Wine yes. and Co is out there soon. But uh, Simon, thanks thanks so much for coming on the show today, um, okay. both for the Metternich piece but also for the wine. And I know what I'm being tempted towards uh, <laughs> once the show concludes. <laughs> Cheers! Thank you that's so much. <laughs> Take care. And thank you to the audience out there for attending this less than conventional salon. Um, we would love to see you in person, but that is uh, not possible just yet. We're hoping and that it, the city will open up soon, but keep in touch with our uh, Metropole in Vienna Corona updates page on the website to learn more. Um, so Metropole is Austria's main source for news and updates in English, and the team greatly relies on your support in these hard times. To show your solidarity, please subscribe to Metropole. More than ever, every subscription counts. More than, <laughs> you can also donate by books like our Survival Guide for Health or individual copies of the magazine. And a big thank you to our subscribers and customers who make Metropole possible. If you're looking for more information, you can you know check out the uh, Corona Updates page on metropole.at or if you want to help out and support your community, go to the Vienna Community Board on um, the, here on Facebook. Tom tomorrow we will have a representative of the uh, Vienna Business Agency ex and the Expat Center um, to discuss with us uh, resources for expats in this time, whether that's small businesses or individuals. Uh, thanks again to everyone, uh, Simon, Dardis, Philip, and Julie, Julia for coming on the show today. Um, we appreciate your time, and for everyone else out there, stay healthy, stay isolated, be patient, and we love you. Bye-bye.